Field, located 16 miles from Convair, San Diego, and just one half mile north of the international boundary between Mexico and the United States, has been chosen as the site for the second phase of the XFY-1 flight test program. The XFY-1, the first airplane wherein the thrust of the propellers exceeds the weight of the airplane, and the first to take off vertically, is powered by a muscle-packed turboprop engine. This power plant drives contra-rotating propellers, each of which is 16 feet in diameter. The XFY-1 airplane features the advantages of the Delta Wing, a design now successfully used on three other high-performance aircraft currently in advanced stages of development by Convair. The Delta Wing is used because of its ability to pull into the vertical without stalling. The XFY-1 first flew in June 1954 inside the huge Moffett Field dirigible hangar. For these first operations, the airplane was contained in a tethering rig mounted in an area of the hangar where the overhead clearance is 184 feet. These tethered operations permitted the safe simulation of free flight and afforded an opportunity to thoroughly familiarize the pilot with the airplane's handling characteristics. Here's pilot Skeets Coleman with project engineer Burr Carroll. Coleman has had extensive experience in helicopters and practically all American fighter craft. Let's ask him about this morning's flight. What's the flight plan today, Skeets? We expect to take off at takeoff power and immediately began the transition to the horizontal. We hope to have this accomplished by 200 feet, at which time we'll start a normal climb up to about 4,000 feet. Well, Skeets, it's obvious that once you make the transition to horizontal, you are committed to reverse that transition to vertical in order to land. What preparations have you made to familiarize yourself with the technique required? As a result of about 100-odd operations in both the tethering rig at Moffett and the free hover operations here at Brown Field, we feel we know a lot about the handling characteristics of the airplane. Essentially, what is your procedure for landing? We expect to make a normal approach and a conventional flare-out. However, at this point, we're going to depart from the conventional procedure and take advantage of the lift characteristics of the delta wing. As we rotate to the vertical, the propeller will take over the lift and we'll make a normal touchdown. Excuse me, I have to go. The pilot's seat is adjustable through a 45 degree arc, enabling the pilot to fly vertically in a nearly upright position. No warm-up is required of the turboprop engine, which enables the airplane to take off as soon as the turbine is brought up to speed. The absence of warm-up is obviously a tremendous advantage to tactical operations. Visualize this takeoff in terms of squadrons in a ground support operation close behind attacking troops. No landing strip required, no warm-up necessary, no extensive base facilities, and nearly immediate contact with the enemy. transition to level flight and begins his climb to 4,000 feet. For the moment, this airplane has lost its special identity, except for that big vertical fin. It is just another good close support fighter with excellent flight characteristics. engine of 5,500 estimated shaft horsepower drives the contra-rotating propellers. The huge blades absorb this power to produce an excess of 17,000 pounds of thrust, which makes possible the vertical takeoff of the XFY-1. The propeller wash induced is sufficient as well to actuate control surfaces, even when the airplane is not in motion. In this airplane, as in the other Delta Wing aircraft, movable surfaces known as elevons attached aft to the wings combine the control effects achieved by ailerons and elevators in conventional airplanes. Although the pilot has never flown the airplane in horizontal flight, 
complete mastery is evident from the moment he is airborne. Control of the airplane in both vertical and horizontal attitudes is naturally and reliably achieved. maneuvers are desired in a first flight, the XFY-1 pulls away from the chase plane with ease. This is both the slowest and the fastest propeller-driven airplane in history. In horizontal flight, the safety of this airplane, with its radical design concept, is exactly the same as a conventional propeller-driven airplane. The important difference is in the takeoff and landing run. These runs are the slowest in the world, and the pilot can be safely ejected at any altitude over 100 feet. Compare this with fast takeoff and hot landing jet aircraft, requiring runways 8,500 feet long. for the landing. Notice the relatively slow speed at high angle of attack, which is normal for Delta Wing aircraft. A conventional airplane would flare out at this point and cut power, but the XFY-1 noses up and with the application of power literally and actually hangs on its prop. estimates on how this maneuver would be executed has been confirmed. And now for the letdown. Flight operation completed. The practical application of this new and radical flight concept, witnessed today in the Convair XFY-1, brings closer to implementation the ideal of tactical air assault without the necessity for elaborate fixed bases. Convair and the United States Navy have begun a new chapter in the history of aviation. a.m. on 1 October 19, the WS-107A missile 31-15 started its trip from Convair, San Diego to AFMTC, Florida. This missile, complete except for propulsion components, was assigned specifically for route exploration. Objective, transport by truck trailer over a route carefully surveyed in July 1956. October, designated MD, the caravan crossed the coastal range without incident. Killer men were used to help steer the trailer on curving mountain roads and to check gas pressure during extreme elevation changes. 
4,118 feet to 100 feet below sea level. Elapsed time, 11 and 3 quarter hours, with travel limited to daylight hours only. A double underpass was encountered just east of Benson, Arizona. This obstacle was negotiated with no difficulty. Earlier, the tightest squeeze of the trip was encountered at an underpass 13 miles west of Benson, Arizona. Actual clearance there was reported at being slightly under 14 feet. With missile height at 14 feet, passage was accomplished by jacking down the trailer, affording a temporary lower road clearance, but allowing adequate height clearance to pass. Leaving Las Cruces at 6 a.m., the missile caravan entered Texas at approximately 7 o'clock. Front and rear pilot vehicles, equipped with flashing red overhead lights, facilitated handling of traffic. The newly designed cover apparently affords adequate protection against weather and excessive curiosity. No publicity was given the convoy, which apparently drew only idle curiosity from local citizens, especially in Texas, where folks seem to have been accustomed to the jumbo size article. A detour was made around Houston at the request of Texas officials. Reached stopover point, Navasota, Texas, 5.40 p.m. At Navasota, Texas, it was necessary to change the eight nitrogen cylinders which furnished pressurization for the missile tank. Upon arrival at the Texas-Louisiana border, the convoy was met by state police to furnish escort across the state. Stops for traffic signals were averted, which contributed to the excellent time mileage accomplishment. Heavy traffic encountered on this leg of the trip was navigated with ease. At one of the meal stops, a bystander asked a convoy technician if that was a Redstone missile. Another bystander thought it was part of a traveling carnival. Because of restrictions on weekend travel through Alabama, the convoy was forced to stop in Biloxi. Oversized dimensions of the load made it mandatory to secure permits from each state for travel on specified highways. During the trip, pillar men were used for trailer guidance on sharp turns or when bad roads or heavy traffic made it necessary. At other times, pillar men were used as lookouts and for traffic assistance. The missile trailer was under guard at all times. The missile was stored at Keesler Field, Saturday afternoon and Sunday. Leaving Biloxi, the convoy had an anticipated delay halfway to the Mississippi-Alabama border when the narrow toll station horizontal clearance made it necessary to use the left lane. It was on this day that the most obstacles were encountered during the trip. There was heavy traffic through Mobile and numerous narrow bridges, requiring the police escort to stop opposing traffic. Outside of Mobile, the convoy was held up nearly two hours by a truck with a blowout blocking the narrow bridge. The clearances on all underpasses and bridges were measured during the physical survey of the route in July 1956. There was no appreciable delay during the trip because of the missile size although this was the largest cubic displacement load ever transported coast to coast. Overall length of load, trailer with tractor, 90 feet. Maximum width, 14 feet. Maximum height, 14 feet. Approximate weight of missile and trailer, 34,000 pounds. Force loads in the missile structure were monitored throughout the entire trip. These loads varied from 1.2 G on smooth roads at low speeds to a maximum of 7G while traveling over rough roads at high speed.
On some of the narrow roads and causeways through Florida, it was necessary to stop opposing traffic. The mileage for this day compares favorably with mileage made to the open spaces of Texas, pointing up the increase in efficiency of convoy personnel. Delays caused by bad weather or high winds will prevent scheduling daily mileage of future delivery, but this trip will serve as a yardstick. Missile 4A, the first flight missile, is scheduled for delivery in December 1956. Missile 8A will be delivered in February of 1957, 12A in April 1957, 14A in May 1957. There will be 26 missiles delivered during 1957 and 1958. This Pathfinder missile traveled 2,547 miles in less than eight days. It was delivered at AFMPC at 4.30 p.m. on 9 October 1956, four days ahead of the schedule in the book that was published. Atlas ready. This is Vandenberg Air Force Base, headquarters for the 1st Missile Division of the Strategic Air Command. It is the United States Air Force's first operational ICBM missile base, and spread out over its thousands of acres are launch sites for both intermediate range and intercontinental ballistic missiles. From these towers, now ready, the Strategic Air Command will launch the Atlas. Until September 9th, we had no operational ICBM capability. All previous Atlas launchings have been research and development tests performed at Cape Canaveral for the Air Force by Convair Astronautics. Development of the Atlas has been under the direction of the Air Research and Development Command through its Ballistic Missile Division. Over a thousand industrial teams contributed their talents to bring Atlas from basic design to operational capability in less than five years. The first Atlas launch from Vandenberg was accomplished by an Air Force crew operating from this complex. These Air Force crews trained for their job at Convair Astronautics and at Vandenberg. They are men of the 576th Strategic Missile Squadron, 1st Missile Division. All of the electrical and mechanical equipment required to launch Atlas is remotely controlled from the blockhouse, which contains the most advanced checkout and launch control equipment yet devised. The consoles in this room control all three Atlas pads. The five men at these stations will be in control of the tactical training launch you are about to see and are on 24-hour standby in the event of an alert. An adjoining room houses checkout equipment which is almost completely automated. Decks of punched cards are used to activate the system. Tactical launch mode start. The status of individual parts is displayed on the console and on a printed paper tape. This display in the control center indicates the status for groups of these systems. The use of automatic checkout equipment makes it possible to check thousands of items in a matter of minutes to keep missiles and launch equipment ready for firing on 15 minutes notice. The command post is about two miles from the Atlas launchers. It is the clearinghouse for all range information and in the event of an actual retaliatory action, would serve as the nerve center of all tactical operations at Vandenberg. The officers in charge are only seconds away from this direct line to Strategic Air Command headquarters in Omaha, Nebraska. In the event of an attack on the United States, the strategic decision to launch an Atlas would come through this instrument. Guidance of the missile through its powered flight is also centered in this building. The General Electric guidance antennas receive a continuous signal from the missile. This communication is analyzed by a Burroughs electronic computer, which accurately determines if the missile is on its proper course. If it isn't, a return signal goes out to Atlas, telling it to correct its flight path. Among the many additional units required to support a missile training launch are Air Police, responsible for security, Air Force instrument and camera groups, and range safety. When all upper levels of the missile have been checked and secured, the access tower is removed.
Atlas now stands alone, ready. Automated machines will finish its preparation for flight. Electronic eyes followed the flight of Atlas long after it had disappeared from human sight. Less than 30 minutes later, the first operational ICBM flight was history. Atlas traveled 4,300 miles southwest across the Pacific Ocean. The nose cone impacted near Wake Island on target. A highly successful first ICBM flight for the Strategic Air Command of the United States Air Force. This is the surface of the moon as seen through a powerful telescope. It's a sight familiar to all of us. Man has long felt a need for a similar perspective of our own planet. But until recently, his concept has been limited by an educated imagination. But now we can look back on our Earth. You are looking down on it from 700 miles in the sky. Your eye for this spectacular view is a 16-millimeter motion picture camera thrust into space 
by an Air Force Atlas Intercontinental Ballistic Missile. On August 24, 1959, a camera carrying Atlas missile thundered aloft from Cape Canaveral, Florida. Primarily, the flight was for research and development to further perfect the Atlas missile as a weapon system. But this Atlas had an extra assignment, photograph Earth. To brief you on this historic flight, here is J.R. Dempsey, manager of the Air Force Atlas program for General Dynamics Corporation. Although Convair Astronautics designed the Air Force Atlas primarily as a weapon for national defense, it is now playing a major role in man's search for knowledge about space. The motion pictures of Earth were taken by a camera carried in this capsule. The capsule also contained scientific instruments to gather flight data. The camera carrying capsule was placed into the re-entry vehicle, which was designed to carry a nuclear warhead. Developed by the General Electric Company, the re-entry vehicle can withstand the intense heat generated by aerodynamic friction during its return through the Earth's atmosphere. In a moment, we'll see the motion pictures of Earth taken from space. This is how the mission was accomplished. The Atlas is propelled vertically from its launching pad by liquid propellant rocket engines, which are made by the rocket dying division of North American aviation. The engine power is roughly equivalent to that generated by eight 880 jet airliners. At launch, Atlas climbs slowly at first, then picks up speed and arcs over into the prescribed trajectory. It continues to accelerate to a tremendous rate, eventually reaching a velocity of about 16,000 miles per hour. After about two and a half minutes of flight, this rear section, which holds the twin-chambered booster engine, is jettisoned. Now Atlas is powered only by its sustainer engine and by these small vernier engines on the sides, which also help to stabilize the missile. At an altitude of about 200 miles, the re-entry vehicle separates from the main body. It was at this point in space that the camera began photographing the Earth below. For this flight, the re-entry vehicle was stabilized automatically so that the rear of the unit pointed towards Earth. As the re-entry vehicle turned slowly in space, the camera followed the arc of the horizon. The camera carrying Atlas reentry vehicle followed this course down the Atlantic Missile Range. The camera started about here, some 200 miles high. At first, it pointed back toward the coast of Florida. As the reentry vehicle streaked downrange, constantly turning, the camera photographed this ocean area. These islands of Puerto Rico and Hispaniola, and finally, the coast of South America. We made some enlargements from the motion picture film to clarify what you're going to see. First, you'll see the main body of the Atlas fall away. You can recognize the eastern seaboard of the United States, the Florida Peninsula, Lake Okeechobee, and Cape Canaveral. Farther along, you see nothing but water, represented by this black area. This white strip is a storm front, which extends northeast across the Atlantic. As the camera continues scanning the globe, we're able to pick up the Caribbean islands of Puerto Rico and Hispaniola. Take a close look at these islands. They'll serve as an excellent reference point when you're watching the film. As the islands pass before the camera on each sweep of the horizon, they will diminish in size as the altitude increases. In the final second of the film, you'll recognize the northeast coast of South America and the Amazon River Delta. Hundreds of miles over the Atlantic Ocean, the re-entry vehicle separates from the Atlas. The camera starts. At the upper left is the body of the missile falling free. Cape Canaveral, where just seconds ago this camera rested atop an Atlas, is covered by the triangular-shaped cloud layer. Extending downward at bottom right is the eastern seaboard of the United States. As the re-entry vehicle rotates, the camera sweeps out across the Atlantic Ocean. We're now about 250 miles up. The dark areas are water, white patches are clouds. That large white strip of clouds is a storm front. The arc of the horizon at this point is approximately 2,000 miles across. 
The camera is making a full circular sweep of the horizon every two minutes. We have almost completed the first sweep. We're now at a distance of about 350 miles. The small white spot crossing the screen is the island of Puerto Rico. In a direct line below Puerto Rico is the island of Hispaniola, where the Dominican Republic and Haiti are located. Near the horizon, the north coast of South America. The dark spot jutting into the coast is the Bay of Venezuela. On the second sweep of the camera, Florida can still be seen near the horizon. The re-entry vehicle is still rising and racing southeast at a speed of about 14,000 miles per hour. As we complete the circuit, Puerto Rico and Hispaniola appear once more, this time smaller. This film was obtained over a period of about 10 minutes. The camera made five complete sweeps of the horizon. It weighed only five pounds and carried about 40 feet of film. It measured a compact two and one half by six inches, and it was powered by a 28 volt motor. The film was exposed at a rate of two and one half pictures each second. A 5.3 millimeter wide angle lens with the diaphragm removed was used with a neutral density filter. The shutter speed was one three hundredth of a second. As the re-entry vehicle approaches its apogee, or the highest point of its flight, we are approximately 700 miles high. As we near the end of our space trip, watch the area near the horizon. That body of land coming into view is the mainland of South America. At the lower right, entering the picture as a large, dark section, is the delta of the Amazon River.